Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone doing today? I hope the clock change has caught you off guard, like we were a little confused. But hopefully, everyone is now able to join. And anyways, it would be recorded for people who might have missed it. Uh, now the clock has shifted one more hour, so it should be 8:30 IST, and everyone has to add one more hour on whatever the schedule was. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here again. And I appreciate you taking time to discuss technical stuff, behavioral stuff as we move forward. So we'll discuss lots of interesting stuff today too. Currently, I am the only person holding the fort. Everyone is busy. James would be joining soon. So serverless track is still there. And then we'll talk about uh, the other aspect of behavioral track also. I'll, I'll talk to James today about his journey because there were some question received that, hey, why don't you talk about your own journeys that how you ended up into AWS, what you did, how you have started working towards it. So we will be discussing this thing today with James. So hopefully everyone would enjoy and would learn something new. Keep your questions coming. I'm the only one right now, but uh, James would be joining soon. Michelle has some, uh, some health things, so she would be joining maybe a little later. And then everyone else is busy, but we will we'll be having lots of discussion. I hope everyone had good weekend or at least planning for a good weekend. So without further ado, let me talk about today's topic, which is related to migration. And we will be discussing that how migration can be an interesting topic and what are the options available for you to get started with migration. Keep your questions coming. I'm monitoring chat on a second screen, so I would be happy to answer as many questions as I can take. I'll uh, cold and damp in London, UK today. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the same weather, isn't it? <laughs> so I would say London is uh, 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 everything is good about London except weather. That's how I tell people about it. So yeah, weather is little complicated. I was not well yesterday. I am good today. So that's why I was uh, little. I may look little tired today, but I'm still okay. I would still be happy to help you out. Okay, obviously unpredictable. That is the London weather. All right. So let me get started here and talk about what this all topic is. We will be discussing today on the seven hours of migration, which is a very common thing you would hear and you would be understanding a different aspect associated with that. We will be then having discussion. I, I, I have forgot to remove the topic here, observability, but the topic here would still be from the James would be about monitoring the sorry migration of serverless because that is also a uh, important aspect of your thing so migration would be still carried out you could think about of it is uh, third eighth hour of it migration of serverless so we'll discuss that james would take care of that and i'll then talk to james about his journey about aws that how he started and what he has done so far and he got a promotion so i would try to ask some questions that how he got promoted what things he has winter is coming exactly all right let's get started here now before we talk about how the migration actually happens we need to understand that why somebody migrates my focus is always on understanding the why of the technology because technology yes it solves some problem but why we need that specific solution that's what i am interested in so we'll talk about what are the business drivers for migration why we people migrate to cloud and these are some of the drivers these are not all the exhaustive list but it covers most of the topics which a person and maybe having in mind when they start migrating to cloud. So maybe they are looking for more agile development and they want better productivity for their people. They don't want to do undifferentiated heavy lifting. They want their team to focus on the important stuff. And that's why they may thought about migrating. So that is another aspect of migration. So migration may be because of business agility and productivity requirement. Maybe outsourcing changes. You had a data center lease and that lease is expiring or you want don't want to renew that lease for whatever reason. And that's why you are looking to have a place to run your workload or application. So that is another business driver. Security would be improved. Why? Because you are now being protected by global infrastructure of AWS and everything is controlled. There are teams available to help you out. So probably that could be another aspect of why somebody would be looking to migrate. And obviously saving money is one of the factor customers consider when they are trying to migrate to cloud. So obviously that is also going to be there. Right. So hopefully this thing is clear. So we may have here improved security. We may be able to save some money. All these would be the benefit which I would have once I start migrating to cloud. Okay. Now 
some more aspect which sometimes people do not think about i spoken to a lot of people in the companies who are in required for migration that is talent now let's say if you are a new hire you don't want to work for a company who is still working on cobol right there's no market anymore for products like that and that's why every new person who is coming out of universities and college they are all looking to go, go for a company who is ensuring that they leverage the best possible new technologies so that is another thing finding talent for cloud is easier because it is being part of a lot of curriculum a lot of universities are gearing up towards it so finding talent is much easier for cloud find rather than finding a cobol programmer going global quickly you may be expanding your footprint and you may be wanting to go forward and have something more started so that's why you may want to have a going global quickly kind of a mindset and that's why cloud is the best thing for you or you may want to improve availability you may do not want you may not want to keep multiple data center and maintain them but you still want availability and cloud can give you that kind of atmosphere to improve availability or the last thing here which is mentioned maybe you are going with a new project which is not possible currently with your on prem environment or for which you require a lot of investment or lot of stacks would be high stacks are very high for that so probably cloud would be a good way to experiment and then move forward with that so these are some of the business drivers the challenge we get here that as you start migrating the things would go out of hand to 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 avoid technology obsolescence exactly ganesh that is completely true and the challenge is that enterprise migration can be challenging it is not like just hey like moving from one place to another i could relate to my experience of shifting house i migrated last week from uh, to a different place where my son would be going to university so what happened like i had to take care of lots of thing and i'm still taking care of lots of thing migration is not like just packing one or two bags and moving if it was it would be much easier but we have lots of thing to take care your tv connection your internet connections maybe then you need to have electricity sorted maybe you need to have furniture sorted you need to to inform bank and lots of thing so same thing enterprise migration to cloud can also be very challenging so let's go ahead and talk about what could be some of the challenges and how we can mitigate it now before we migrate we have to discuss about these three things which is called discovery assess prioritize and determine the migration path so let's first focus on what is the discovery phase you need to know that what you want to carry right so if i give you my example when i had to move from a place in london to another place i started discovering that what things i want to carry and what thing i may not want to carry and what would be the way to carry it so that same thing like any migration like i moved from uh, india to dubai and dubai to london so obviously i have done a lot of physical migrations in my life and obviously that has given me some idea so first thing we have to talk about is discovery now discovery here we are focusing on the on premises discovery i need to know like what are the different available resources i have and which one i want to migrate so what i would be doing i have to first to start with discovery of my applications that what exactly i have to migrate what things i have to carry and what thing i may not want to carry so i have to start with the discovery process of this so discovery would be required in that case now obviously manual discovery is not something a enterprise would be looking into so they would be looking for some tools and there may be multiple tools available but we have a tool available which is called aws application discovery service and this service can help you understand different aspect of your application how they communicate which port they talk to what are the dependencies associated so all this information can be accessed by application discovery service and it can be then dumped into an amazon S3 bucket so you would get a lot of detail about the utilization of application cpu connections and the network ports communication which dependencies are there that will all be discovered by discovery service and that would be available into s3 now it could be some file csv or other format and what we would be probably doing we would leverage tools like amazon athena or we would leverage tools like migration hub 
who would help us understand what are the portfolio of applications I have. So my discovery tool in AWS, AWS application discovery tool, it can work on a agent basis. Like on Linux and Windows machine, you could install an agent and it would collect data and put it into a central place. Or if you are using VMware environment, then we provide an agentless discovery. So we talk to vCenter directly and that vCenter server would give us information about all the types of VM which you are running in your environment. So first thing is a discovery. So you need to identify that what are the ways by which you would utilize. What is the best time for apply for a job? <laughs> Very low opening. Uh, we, we can take talk about that a little bit later, Akshay. So hold on to that question. We will we will talk about it. Now, so discovery phase is obviously where I would identify what are the available options to me, and then I have to perform what I have to perform prioritization. I don't expect that everything would be prioritized, and I say everything would have the same priority, right? So maybe. First thing, like when I had to move, I had to sort out internet connection first because I work from home and I needed internet to get started. So before even I moved to my new house, what I did, I, re I realized that I need to have internet connection ready. So I applied for that internet connection and got it sorted. So we have to prioritize what are the things and then something I would carry personally with me rather than putting into a transport like my passports or my valid document or my laptop, I would carry with me. So that then it will be prioritization of what things would go where. And once we have identified all these things, we would then start about determining the migration path. And that is where all your seven R's would be coming into picture. So R here is representing a way here we are talking about a relocate. So R here is representing a relocate with VMware environment. Let's see what this option is, why we would use this kind of option, what I could achieve by relocating by VMware. Now, probably people know about VMware. VMware is a very prominent way of running virtual machines on premises and AWS has worked with them and we have a solution which is called VMware Cloud on AWS. It's a jointly engineered solution. What we are doing here, we are working with VMware to provide you the same kind of experience you have on premises on to cloud and that is one of the options. So maybe as a customer, if I was leveraging VMware environment in my on premises, I was using vSphere 6 or higher and then maybe I was using some hybrid link mode and all. So I had all my virtual machines running here and these virtual machines, I want to migrate to AWS. So that is possible. The solution we offer that is called VMware Cloud on AWS. And through this, you can do vMotion, which, which means a live virtual machine while it is serving user, while it is serving traffic can be migrated to cloud without a downtime. Or you could have that but being vMotion probably would be for some machines and for bulk, you would be going with the extension we offer, which is called VMware Hybrid Cloud Extension. It is basically a VMware product, but it is available once you go with VMware Cloud on AWS. So if you were running containers, if you were running your applications in VMware environment, then you could just relocate them by just few click of button and some configuration to AWS environment, your administrator who were connecting here to a vCenter server and managing all the stuff for you, they would still have the same experience. Here again, they would have a vCenter server and they would be managing everything like an extension of the existing data center. And once you migrate it, it's not one way. If you want, you could bring it back also. Maybe for testing purpose, you migrated few VMs here and then you migrated them back to see how the performance difference is. And once you are happy, you can pull the plug and then all of them can be moved. And obviously you could put a schedule for different VMs. So on a schedule basis, your virtual machine can be transferred from on-premises to VMware. So that is called a relocate with VMware. Right? It is a relatively a new offering. I, when I say new, it is like four years maybe into making. So we should be utilizing that. How do we relocate using site-to-site -site VPN or direct connect or snowball? It, it is up to you. See, when I'm talking here about Raj here is about vMotion and hybrid cloud. These are online way of migrating. So you need to get network connectivity sorted, right? So you can have, so VMware offers you solution. There is a solution called NSX. You could have NSX here also. And this NSX solution can give you a way to create a tunnel 
from on-prem up to the cloud so you could have your own vpn tunnel created and through this network connectivity you should be able to forward your traffic so absolutely you would need network to be sorted but if you don't want to have aws solution for that you can utilize nsx nsx also gives you vpn solution and probably if your admins are using vmware here they would be aware about nsx and they could set up a endpoint in nsx in another location which will be aws AWS and on this tunnel then your VMs can be migrated or it could be direct connect you need to sort out physical network connectivity for this migration right so hope that answers your question you would need to sort out connectivity it can happen on public networks too but no we will prefer to have it on a private network but that is a still a way of option now can I use snowball answer is yes I may take dump of everything here into a snowball device move the snowball device into aws and then restore it but then it would be requiring a downtime and then i have to configure replication so still possible but not like a very enterprise solution or most cases in some corner case scenario maybe your on-prem is running into a very isolated environment and you want to bring data from there that time a uh, snowball can be a good option so snowball i would consider this is good for offline migration if i'm looking for online migration i would do vmotion or i would use scx which is vmware hybrid extension thanks ganesh for sharing that right so we are talking about that exactly relocate so we talked about relocate first and then what once you start using this then probably you have some more workload which you want to move so we relocated it determine the configuration you need and you could then move your machine and second thing you may do is call rehosting this is the most common approach most customers may have used for migration that is called rehosting or we call it lift and shift so we will lift our workload and shift those workload on to vm into into aws environment so that can be done through automated way like if you see it here what we are showing you here that we are doing rehosting which is called lift and shift of your workload and that we are doing through automation and you could use some migration tools i'll talk about them and through this you are able to move your virtual machines into on-prem from on-prem to cloud I may say that you are moving from on-prem, but if you look at other cloud provider, then the concept would still remain the same. So maybe you are into a different cloud, maybe private or a public, and you want to now move to AWS. So these process may still be applicable to you because the concepts remain the same. You need to sort out network connectivity, and afterward you could trigger your on-prem migration or from other cloud should not be a problem at all. So relocate, rehosting is called lift and shift. In this case, you could take care of tools which are automated. What these tools do basically, they read the configuration of your existing machine and create a replica of that machine into AWS. You could run this replica into an isolated fashion. And once you verify everything is working fine, then you could say, okay, I want to perform the migration now. So that is then you, I would make this down and it, I would make it up. So that is a way which is called lift and shift. I could use automation for that using some migration tool, or you could say, no, I don't want to use automation tool. Maybe there is a license cost involved. So what I would do, I may take a manual approach towards it. Maybe I was running a machine here with Windows on top of it. Then there was a Java and then there was an application available. I could go ahead into AWS environment and say, hey, I would have an instance created that would be running Windows version. On that, I would then install Java and then I would bring my application. And on that application, I would then transfer the data which we have collected here so that is another way where i would manually install things configure it as per my requirement and then deploy the required application and get started now sometimes customer prefer this approach why they prefer this approach because they may be utilizing that they are having uh, existing tools which they were using in on-prem they were using maybe puppet 
they may be using chef they may be using ansible and that time they would prefer to have them exact a vm and that you would be utilizing that there should not be a problem let's see my question might be silly but was wondering migrating application to ec2 is running on virtual machine only so why to use vmware against after cloud migration good question it's not a silly question let me go back in a minute i'll come back to your question in a minute parna don't worry on that so hopefully this thing is clear that rehosting either it could be done through a automated approach or it could be a manual approach so let's see what happens now so once we have done this, we may rehost application. So we give you services like AWS Server Migration Service, SMS as we call it. And this SMS service, what it is doing, see this. It is capturing your on-prem information, the machine details, and converting them into an AMI. And once you have an AMI available, then obviously what you could do, you could launch machines from there. So that is one option that you may say server migration service. These are my source read details from them. And as a destination, please create a AMI for me. And I would then launch my machines from this AMI should not be a problem at all. So that is our service you could utilize called server migration service. So that is one option, right? Now, is it the only option available answer is no there are a lot of marketplace solutions available a lot of third parties are getting their bread and butter by migration like companies like here one is called cloud endure now it is a aws AWS acquired company, but other companies like ATA Data, River Meadows, these are also third party products which you could use to get these things sorted and get into your application. So that should not be a problem at all on that. Right, good. Hopefully this thing is clear. So we talked about relocate with VMware. We talked about rehosting, which is a common thing, lift and shift. And I will talk about more, but let me answer the question Parna had. So let me explain that. So her question is that if it is a VMware environment, what is the difference here when I am moving to VMware on AWS? Let me explain that. Now VMware on AWS, when you are running your virtual machine, so let's say this is a VM. This is a VMware VM, which is made up of VMX file. It has a VMDK file associated. It would have a capability to do vMotion associated with that. So when I'm saying I am relocating with VMware, what I'm doing, I am still keeping exact same VM. I am not converting them into AMI. I'm not converting them to a EC2 machine. They would still be remaining a VMware native virtual machine. They won't be becoming a EC2. So challenge here, why we will need a similar approach like this? Because let's say I have admins here. These admins know how to utilize and how to maintain a VMware environment. These are all my VMware admins. They know nothing about VPC. They know nothing about what is a elastic IP or they know nothing about a subnet. They know only VMware. So either I train them and then let them learn AWS first and then convert everything into AWS environment and then utilize it. Or I would say, hey, admin, you don't have to worry. We would use the same product here, which would be exactly the same, right? So when you migrate, let's say I migrated from Dubai to London. Now, what if, if somebody has taken care of migration for me that they said that hey, your son was studying in school X here. We have branch of that school X here in London also. Let's go ahead and that you were using HSBC for your bank here. Also, you would use HSBC right maybe you were getting your groceries from a store in uae called carry four and i would have a carry four also here maybe i migrated my credit card also into the same company you get the point the point here is i'm not changing anything at all whatever i was doing everything as it is is being migrated otherwise what would have happened hey i was using hsbc now no in london you have to use barclays and you have to register for that carry four is not available you have to get your groceries from tesco this credit card wouldn't be valid here because this was in aed you have to get a credit card which will be into pounds you get the point so this is a this is a virtual machine to a EC2 migration. Got 
so hopefully this thing is clear so to maintain that vmware environment we may want to utilize vmware on aws that's how we would utilize it right so hope that answers your question application migration services successful of successor of cloud india or after the acquisition uh in a way because we added more things also on that so yes ganesh i agree on that it is mgn as something like successor of cloud endure but yeah cloud endure was a nice product and still people use it but yes that is a new feature now which is application migration service okay good so this rehost is talk clear the third r you may think about is called your replay platforming what is replatforming lift and reshape this is how things are so lift and reshape let me explain what this reshape is right so if you had a virtual machine here this virtual machine was running a windows version of 2008 it was running sql server 2003 nobody bothered even after it went out of your production support but now when you are migrating you are saying hey as we are migrating let's get take care of some more enhancements also so i would still make it as a virtual machine or let's say i would make it a ec2 now and along with that instead of a windows 2008 i would go with windows 2019 and sql i would be utilizing sql 2019 on top of it or i may say hey sql is no longer required for me let me move database to aurora completely that is what we mean by lift and reshape we are not moving that as it is but we are enhancing it we are ensuring that whatever old things were there they are removed and we take care of moving things in a much easier fashion and into a much supportable hardware or software combination so that is called lift and reshape that so hope this thing is clear so reshape is basically ensuring that you are customizing it as per your requirement as per maybe technical or business requirement and still maintaining the similar type of architecture so replatform is also a very common thing replatform may happen for your operating systems may happen for your databases so maybe i was running some windows application and something here on instances when i say i want to perform a relocate i would still get an ami but when i launch this i may utilize sorry when i do replate form i may utilize tools in aws like aws ops work or automation or i may say i would be using windows upgrade also so i was running windows 2003 i want to move to 2016 and tools like river meadows can help me in doing that operating system migration that is possible application can be migrated and i may use ops work for that shouldn't be an issue and then similarly i may utilize lots of software coming from marketplace to help me with this kind of migration so that is my replate form of windows and upgrading to so i moved windows but i upgraded it to a higher version also that's what we mean by a replate form is everyone okay so far any question when we first intend to migrate should we first consider the order of the strategy meaning should we look into first rehost i would say no you don't work from that francis you work from application first thing you would be doing is you would be creating a list of priority of application and i don't expect that a enterprise company would do migration maybe in a week or a month i have been into migration project which completed into 3 to 4 years because that company had too many things to migrate consider companies like ge obviously lots and lots of things there they may be taking a 3 to 4 year to migrate so i don't consider that i have to first start by selecting the strategy first you select what you have to migrate and then you select how you would migrate so you first start with your inventory list and in that inventory list you then decide that hey this one is good for rehosting this one is good for replatforming this one is good for retain this one is good for rebuild or replate rearchitect so you decide on that so you decide on what you have and then you decide on the strategy to migrate does it make sense so that's how you decide not the other way around you first decide with the, your list and then you keep moving forward so that is my replatforming and through this replatforming would you like which are would you use migrate from microsoft azure to aws it would depend 
that's my favorite answer isn't it why it would depend what if if you were using let's say you were using a microsoft azure here and you were using vmware software on azure then you would do relocate right you may go ahead and say i was using a windows based operating system and i would still use windows so that would be your maybe with windows 2019 and 2019 service pack 2 or something then it would be your refactor sorry it would be your rehosting lift and shift so i would say it depends what workloads you have and you would then decide what works best for your environment and based on that you would move forward so that is replatforming of your windows and upgrading it and then you would be also maybe replatforming databases right so we have database migration services you may go ahead and say i was using sql and i want to use amazon rds here why not go ahead for that or you may say no i want to go completely serverless by dynamo db or i want to utilize aurora serverless or i want to leverage amazon redshift instead of ibm netiza or green plum i was using on prem no problem at all so the dms service can help you in this kind of migration and sometimes customers databases are so so big that they don't want to do online transfer so what you could do in this particular case again physical devices can be helpful so you could take this 100 terabyte data into a snowball then shift all the data so maybe this 100 tb maybe we had a 50 tb database here we moved 50 tb using this and while this process happened it took let's say 7 days just give an example and only one new tb of data got generated so that time we could only do change migration so only one tb will go online and remaining 50 tb went offline through snowball so that is also possible we should not have a problem at all on that so that three platforming is also possible for databases you decide thanks james thanks for being here uh questions should be there feel free to drop them in chat and i'm trying during my session yeah good hi james good to have you here thank you now next r is repurchasing this is also a good option right i want to replace drop and shop hey i was using a let's say a antivirus solution i am quite happy with that or i was using a vpn solution or i was using a ips ids kind of a stuff and i want to keep on using that let me talk with that vendor x and if that vendor also has those product available in aws let me see what are the option for getting these things migrated as it is so i could repurchase it so repurchase is also a valid option so you have your purchase commercial of the self software which you could buy and through these you may want to modify install manual install and setup can happen and maybe i could have everything being migrated to cloud by repurchasing it so repurchase is a very common thing people do for anything we would utilize on that so we can use absolutely you would use all r to migrate right isn't it so if i give you my example i moved last week now some things obviously i had migrated as it is right if i am talking about let's say my internet connection i was using bt internet connection here bt was not available in the place i moved so what i have to do i had to move to virgin now so obviously this has changed right but maybe i was using bank into barclays and i am still using barclays as a bank so that hasn't changed so for some of that some r would work relocate rehost replatform and repurchase i don't expect that a company would have only one r selected for their migration as i said it will depend on what you want to migrate right so maybe when i moved from dubai to london i bought lot of stuff right but probably the things like if i had a car i make take the car but i thought no point in getting the car i won't be driving in london so there is no point to bring that car but if i have my winter clothes obviously i would be needing more so that i would be obviously bringing to london because that would be required here or maybe i didn't had winter clothes in dubai and i had to buy new here once i came to london so it depends on what you want to migrate i don't expect a company to have only one approach they would be mostly using multiple approach to migrate should not be a problem at all all right so 
uh, in my project there are migration of db from on trim to aurora and then that is a frequent task to create mysql dump and these dumps of shoes are created in s3 followed by next step what category migration it comes to i would say it is the platform so you have your mysql here and you are moving to a different platform completely which is aurora so that is your uh, re-platform. Could you give an example of a repurchase? Why not? So maybe, as I said, maybe I was using, let's say a Cisco call connect, a software for voice communication, right? I want to now still use that. And Cisco has an offer here. Cisco says you can use it into AWS and we would give you the same discount. Or I was using Oracle on-prem I still want to use Oracle into AWS and I say Oracle now my license were for on-prem Can you give me a cloud license for my workload? So that could be a use case where I may want to repurchase existing solution So if you already have something invested into Antiviruses, maybe some VPN software, maybe some AutoCAD software or anything which is very specific to your need, which you paid money for long term licensing. You may talk to your vendor and say, Vendor, can you give me a cloud based license for these products? So maybe I was using Salesforce here, right? Salesforce offers you an on prem solution kind of a sort of thing and it offers you a cloud based solution too. So you may want to migrate and repurchase the cloud subscription because here maybe you were paying on a per seat and maybe here you would be paying per usage. It depends. So that's how we may want to perform a repurchase for those solutions. Right. So hopefully this thing is clear and you get a better understanding on what is repurchase now. So marketplace is your go to place simplify software migration provisioning go to marketplace look for what are the best solution for your workload maybe you are looking for a specific operating system maybe you are looking for a specific databases or antivirus or a networking product or storage product that time you may utilize aws marketplace for it and here is the eight popular categories customer mostly deploy from they may want to have a specific operating system security product storage solution sim solution devops thing like you were using puppet chef you were using tipco you were using Altrix. so all these are available into cloud these vendors work with aws and they create their own offering into cloud on a very pay as you go model so that would be another option for me is to call repurchase next r is refactor this one may be most time consuming, but it is most rewarding. Let me explain what refactoring. If you re, if some people call it re-architecting, that is also true. You may also call it rewriting your application, or you may also call it recreating your application, or official name, we call it refactor. What is refactor? Refactor is, let's say you ended up into a solution which is not exactly migratable into a standard format. You had some on-premises solution like Solaris or a traditional server or AS400 or P-Series. So these are not the solution which directly work into cloud. But you want to migrate. So what you would do, you would engage team maybe from AWS, maybe from vendor, maybe from your internal team. And these team would help you to perform a recreation or refactoring of the whole solution. What you would be doing now, you would be building a cloud native application, right? So maybe you start using Lambda, redesign some of the aspect. You started using NoSQL databases. You maybe started using SNS for notification. Maybe you started sending your raw data into S3. So what you did, you completely, completely revamped your architecture, recreated, redesigned, re-architected, and it is a completely new application under the hood. Front end is still the same. It is still your end user may not see a lot of modification, but internally, instead of using traditional systems like Solar, is AS 400 or even IBM or maybe even Microsoft you have completely built it into a cloud native way so cloud native way is a way very good option but obviously it would require lot of efforts for your application depending on how complex the application is these efforts are in terms of manpower and in 
terms of your cost also and time obviously so you would need all these manpower you may have internal team who may do these things for you you may hire a consultant to help you there so there would be cost involved and time involved but the most benefit you would get will be refactoring because you are not leveraging the old traditional technology here you are paying per second here you have adoptive capacity available here you again paying pay as you go kind of a model so that would be that will be a refactor so going serverless would be a refactoring yes it would be now again if it was a serverless to serverless migration because it can also happen that will be a different factor but yes in most cases uh, ronnie it would be considered as refactoring and james would be talking more on that this particular thing which you would be talking about so thanks james so james would be talking about that so that is refactoring right so refactoring is there you could utilize redesign the application application code development would be happening full application life cycle management sdlc you would go through that you would do integration testing and once you are done then you would perform validation this will apply on any r you do you would perform transition and you would then move it to production so these three things would always apply similar to these three things at the start so this is your start point this is your end point and in between there are different paths you could have taken to get your application migrated so you decide what works well for you right now application migration strategy one more is called retain i don't want to move it maybe to move this small application is very complicated i don't have time and efforts required for that maybe this is sometime we call it these are my sunset application that we know that in one year this is going to be retired then why to take time to migrate it so that can also happen so customer may say okay let me retain this application so anything which they don't want to migrate they may retain it and sometime what customers do customers move these services into a co-location facility so you said that hey i had 100 application i migrated 80 and 20 are still in on my on-prem data center now should you pay the whole money to keep data center running for 20 services only probably not so what you would do let these 80 be into aws and that remaining 20 let me move to a third party providers location physical location and that has a direct connect connectivity and because of that i won't have any connectivity issues and i would decommission my data center because i don't want to keep it so i want to retain it in the pristine format but i don't want to retain in my own data center i want to retain it into some other's data center so i would co-locate to a connect direct connect partner and manage service provisioning can also happen so that is what we mean by our retain of things so retain is there you may retain some application which is we do not want to move at all to cloud i would retain it for whatever reason so that is one so we covered six hours and lot let me talk about the last hour now which is seven which is called retire right retire would also be a very common thing Maybe I was using a monitoring software on premises. Now I moved to cloud, I would be using CloudWatch. So why I have to move this monitoring software at all? Maybe I was using WSUS here for patching of my Windows machine, but here we have systems manager. So why I would migrate it? Right. Maybe I was utilizing a log collection service. Here I have cloud trail. So why I have to migrate these things at all? So that's why I may want to retire some application and say, hey, thank you application. You served me well, but I no longer need you. So I would be then retaining, I would be then, sorry, retiring those application or basic ways to say is that I would decommission those application if I do not need them. So that will also happen. So that would be the seventh hour of migration and as i said when you have to move vast data then obviously we have snowball devices which could help you snowmobile can help you and we could bring your data to a cloud region and from there you could run it as long as you want so should not be a problem right so these are the seven hours we talked about relocate as appropriate retire application and host decommission on source retain rehost replatform refactor and repurchase now
these are some percentage which aws team has identified that what customers actually use so if you have 100 200 application 3000 applications to migrate as i said not everything would go into one bucket so you may have bucket for retain then for rehost and these are some of the numbers that if you have 100 application probably this is how the allocation would happen it is just some data may not apply to you but if you look at the common thing here common thing is that most customers go with rehosting and replatforming which is making up around 70 percent of our options right so hopefully this is how you would be able to understand different things associated with that and there are a lot of tools available to accelerate your journey aws has server migration services database migration services vmware services transfer services available so leverage these services and obviously a lot of third parties and partners are also there to help you with your migration so they could all help you in your migration process so hopefully everyone has now better understanding on the seven hours of migration and i think it is a good time to take a break and then just curious ashish what happens to the on-prem physical server most of the time it goes to landfill perna right so or maybe exported into some other countries or maybe they are just decommissioned or like sometime like it's a disk drive and all they have to be destroyed they can't be kept moved outside of it so you may shred those hard disk and those server would be removed ripped off of all the inventory tags and other information which could identify them but that is what may happen once may that may go to landfill or may be exported to some vendor or maybe scrapped for it because there is some precious metal in the servers which they may want to get it faster right so hopefully this thing gives you a better idea on how the migration actually are and how these things work so hope you enjoyed and let's go ahead and take a short break and once we return from break then james will talk about serverless migration which is obviously an important aspect so i'll put a five minute timer and then we will get started again so enjoy your break and we would be then discussing things and if you have any questions keep them coming and we will be seeing them in a after break and then obviously you could reach out to us on linkedin or any other places shouldn't be a problem at all so enjoy your break and i'll speak to and james will speak to you in five minutes thank you so much
welcome everyone and let me hand it over to james i'll add him to stream and i'll stop my sharing james you want to share something i certainly do yes hello everyone how are we all doing today is everybody well Okay, so this, this, so my my plan for this week was actually initially to talk about a um, to talk through like a like a full serverless architecture. But actually, when I saw that um, Ashish was going to cover migrations, I thought it would actually be interesting to cover a migration and and how you would approach a migration to a more serverless architecture. Um, and a common path with most migrations, as Ashish kind of said at the end, is that the majority are either rehost or replatform. If you're coming from on-premise infrastructure to the cloud, then that's probably the best path in a lot of cases to take what you have in the data center and replicate it in the cloud. And then once you get into the cloud, that's when you can really start to think about modernization. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how to modernize your application to use serverless technologies. So first, let's let's set the scene. Let's think, let's just have an architecture that we're going to work through and modernize together. So let's say we've got a pretty typical three-tier web application. We've got some kind of load balancer or front end. We've got an API running on EC2 instances that talks to a database on RDS. We have another EC2 instance that's running some kind of message bus or queuing system. Let's say RabbitMQ. And then we've got some kind of backend service that's reading messages from the queue and then processing the messages on the queue. So this is a pretty typical application setup that you might have picked up from on-premise and moved into the cloud. And now you have it in the cloud and now you've started to hear about this wonderful serverless technology that's really, really cool and it's gonna solve all your problems. So where do we start, right? We have this. We have this architecture now. There's quite a few different components to it. How do we actually decide where to start? Now, if you're modernizing set of containers instead of to serverless, it can be a bit easier to think about because all you're doing is taking an application that's running on maybe an EC2 instance, packaging that into a container, and then maybe running that on ECS or maybe Kubernetes. There's, there's still challenges there, but you're still running a typical application just in a slightly different way. Now, migrating to serverless requires an, a complete paradigm shift in how you think about your applications. Because now you've got all these small pieces of loosely joined architecture that are just completely different to the traditional way of running applications. And that can make trying to decide where you start and how you start to modernize and migrate quite difficult. And of course, as always in software, it absolutely depends. If you were building a brand new application, this is, this is it's completely different, but when you're doing a migration, you need to be a little bit more careful because you don't want to affect your existing users. Now, what I want to, I'm going to introduce a new um, term to you here or a new concept to you in this next slide um, and it's the concept of what we call a minimum viable migration now this isn't a concept I thought of um, this is a concept that, that somebody called Ben Ellerby who's the founder of a consultancy called Alios here in the UK um, and he talks about minimum viable migrations a lot that QR code that is on screen there will take you to an article on Medium where Ben talks about this idea of minimum viable migrations. But what, what a minimum viable migration is, is it's much like the same way you'd think about a minimum viable product if you're building software. If you were building an MVP for an application, you'd aim to get that, that core set of features in the hands of users as quickly as possible. But then when we think about migrations, people tend not to think about that in modernization. They just, it has to be big bang. It all has to go at once. It all has to be modernized. It all has to be serverless. When actually what a minimum viable migration is proposing that you take an iterative approach to your modernization. You don't try and modernize everything all at once. You pick pieces of your architecture and pieces of your application 
and slowly modernize them in an iterative way. And there's two key questions that allow you to do that. The first is what is the business driver for the migration or the modernization? Why is it that you want to modernize? Going back to Ashish's presentation, again, if speed is the ultimate business driver, you probably don't want to be looking at doing this. You probably want to be looking at sticking with rehosts and replatforms. But if the business driver is to maybe make your system more extensible or make it more scalable or resilient, and you've not really got a time constraint, then you can start to look at slightly different options. And then what is the target solution? What architecture are you aiming for in AWS? And based on these two things, you can then start to look at how you will then modernize. So let's go back to our application then, and let's step through how we could take an iterative approach to making this architecture serverless. Um, that's a really good question about whose, whose decision it would be. And um, these kind of decisions would normally come from like a CTO or a team of architects. Obviously, AWS, AWS SAs or ProServe could help guide and help make recommendations. But you know, at the end of the day, it will be the customer whose system it is who will have the final say in um, in how, the direction that you take. And I've seen this before where I've been working in AWS and we've wanted to do one thing and we've recommended to do one thing and the customer wants to take a different approach. And it can put you in slight the challenging or difficult situations. And that's where you've got to come back to being data driven, come back to what are the customer's needs and requirements and work backwards from there and use that to explain your point of view. Um, okay, so let's look at this architecture now. So we want to make this thing serverless and we're gonna do it iteratively. So when we look at this application, there's, there's really five distinct components. We've got our load balancer, we've got our API or our application, we've got our database, we've got some kind of message bus, and then we've got some backend service that's running in the background. Now, just a quick question and just pop a message in the chat, but which of these five areas do you think would be a good place to start with this iteration? Which of these five components do you think kind of would, would be, the, be, the, be the lowest risk? given that we're looking to move to an event-driven serverless architecture. Anyone have any ideas? James, while people are answering, can you remove the bar Maybe with this stop there, sharing? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Every week. It's a little annoying, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Chief. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, message bus by SQS. That is a great shout. The message bus is, of course, a really good way to start database interesting that is um yeah you could start with the database for sure um migrating data and moving databases around is typically more high risk because you know your database is fundamentally all of the key bits you need for your application to function um so let's let's say that that you know parameter was right and we decided to start looking at our message bus because we can introduce an additional message bus without actually affecting our existing system at all. So from within our API that's publishing messages to our message bus currently to RabbitMQ, we could also make that same application published to EventBridge as well at the same time. So we're not affecting our existing application at all. Instead, we're just introducing a new piece of technology, EventBridge in this case. And introducing EventBridge here, because our target state is an event-driven architecture, then opens up a whole range of different possibilities as we start to take this iterative approach. So our existing system now is just going to start publishing messages to EventBridge and still publish to the message bus. So our existing system isn't changing so much. We're just publishing the events to two places. And then what we could look at doing, now that we've got these events going to EventBridge, we could absolutely then start to introduce something like SQS. So the events are still going out to EventBridge and then maybe down to SQS. And then what we can do is just take our backend service and potentially not change any of the actual application code at all. And we just take our backend service and just switch where that's looking at. And we'll just switch that to look at SQS. 
And at this point, remember, we've not actually changed any of our business logic. We've not changed the, the fundamental function of our application. We're iterating slowly. We're slowly starting to introduce EventBridge. Then we introduce SQS and we slowly start to iterate towards this more event-driven architecture. Okay, so now we've got things going up to EventBridge and we've got messages going to SQS and we've managed to get rid of this EC2 instance that's just running our message bus. So now we've become more fault tolerant, more reliable already. And we've actually not really done an awful lot of changes to our application yet. So now we've got a backend service that's running on an EC2 instance that's reading data from SQS. Well, then what can we do? Well, then we could take the data, take the, the application code running on that EC2 instance that's reading data from SQS, and maybe we move that to Lambda. So again, we've got rid of another component of our system. And if you think about this, the, the actual customers who are actually interacting with the system are going to be interacting through the load balancer with the API and the database. So all we're changing at the minute is the backend systems that are making things happen behind the scenes. These are typically quite low risk systems because they're not likely to directly impact the user experience, the user who's actually interacting with this application. So they may see some slow processing while we move things around, but they're not going to start seeing lots of errors in the front end of this application. So now we've taken another component and we've moved that to be serverless. And now we've got Lambda and SQS, but the meat of our application, the API and the database are still running exactly as they were previously. Then we can start to do some really interesting patterns because we're using an application load balancer. So application load balancers allow you to do path-based routing on AWS. So you can say for this path, maybe slash products, I want to keep sending them requests through to my API running on my EC2 instance. But application load balancers actually also integrate with Lambda. You can send requests from ALBs directly to Lambda functions. So what we can then start to look at there is slowly start to pull out pieces of our API. And this is a pattern called the strangler pattern. Um, it's quite commonly seen when you're doing monolith to mic microservices type migrations where you you wrap some kind of load balancer around your application and slowly start to pull out pieces of your application. So now, again, the front end has the, the, the users interacting with this API aren't seeing any different. They're still interacting with the same API endpoint. As far as they're concerned, nothing has changed here. And all we're doing within our load balancer is just saying, if the request is for orders, send them to these Lambda functions. If the request is for products, send them back to our original API. And you can get really tactical about this as well because you could look at which parts of your system are the most valuable to your business. Let's say in this example, it's the products API that is where we earn all our money. Well, then we probably wanna to touch that last, but we might be able to pull out this orders functionality because that's a bit more low risk. And we can slowly start to decompose this architecture. Remember, this is completely iterative now. We're not doing this all at once. We're not trying to migrate and modernize everything at the same time. We're slowly iterating upon things. And then, of course, as somebody's, uh, as Parenthi, you mentioned in the chat again, API to API gateway. So once we've then moved all of our um, API endpoints, maybe we've broken out that products API now, and that's now running on Lambda. We can also now maybe potentially replace the application load balancer and replace that with API Gateway. There's no reason to do that. You could keep the application load balancer there as well. And now we've got almost a completely serverless architecture. All we've got left now is two RDS instances sat in our subnets, in our VPC. Now, typically, at least in my experience, databases tend to be the more tricky things to start to modernize because typically if you're modernizing a database, let's say from SQL to NoSQL, although services like the database migration service can make that easy, typically you're going to need to do some element of redesign because the way you use and query and interact with Dynamo is fundamentally different to how you interact with RDS. 
But there's a couple of things we might start to do here. So we might start to use the database migration service that Ashish talked about. And maybe now we start to iteratively move our databases. So maybe we take them Postgres SQL instances running on RDS and we use DMS to move them to Postgres running on Aurora. Aurora is much more scalable. And then maybe for our orders API, we do actually think, ah, oh, Dynamo is the right, right use case here. So then we start to move our database to Dynamo and we start to refactor to Dynamo DB. And now we are almost entirely serverless. And we've done this in such a way that lowers the risk. And there's always going to be risk in any kind of migration or modernization effort. But we've, we've minimized that risk because we've taken an iterative approach to um, to our system. Um, yes, that's a, absolutely, it's a great point, Paramitha, that if your business logic takes longer than 15 minutes, then of course you would maybe need to change the code to make it more efficient so it takes less, or maybe you just wouldn't use Lambda. That is one of the use cases to not use Lambda potentially if you have applications that need to run for longer than 15 minutes for a single unit of work. Okay, so now we've got this, this serverless architecture, mostly serverless architecture, should I say. Um, and what I'm actually gonna do now is introduce what could potentially be the eighth R of migration, and that is rebuild. And this becomes a possibility once you have a serverless architecture. And I'm actually gonna talk about this in the context of an organization called Cinch. Um, so this was a blog post that actually went live yesterday on the AWS startup blogs. There's a QR code there to go and get to this blog. And it talks about how Cinch um, moved to a serverless architecture during the COVID pandemic. So when the COVID pandemic started, they wanted to switch the direction of their business to start to do a slightly different business model. And they built a proof of concept on their existing container-based platform. And it just wasn't moving fast enough. They weren't getting there quickly enough. So they made the bold decision to pivot and go completely serverless. And because they did that, they managed to build their new application in just six months. And over the course of that six months, they increased the traffic from 6,000 to 16,000 requests per minute. And then when they built this serverless application, they built it using the concept of what's called a walking skeleton. And that's when you take a really tiny part of a larger system that performs an end-to-end -end thing and make that, that tiny little part work really, really well. It doesn't aim for perfection, but it aims to be robust enough to meet the requirements of the system. And then you start to compose these small end-to-end -end functions together into your larger system. So where does, where does Rebuild come into this? Well, Cinch built the search component for their website and they did this really quickly and they did this using that walking skeleton that I talked about. So they had this search component and they put this together really quickly to meet the requirements of the system at that time. So this search component took a, set, a file from S3 and it processed that file, loaded that into Dynamo and then queries ran um, when someone needed to run a search on the website, it loaded everything from Dynamo into memory and then ran the search in memory. It filtered the things in memory. Now, as they started to scale, this kind of architecture didn't really keep up with the scale that they were seeing. Now, if this was a traditional application running on EC2 instances or containers, you might start to look at how you can improve certain parts of it. So you might start to look at how you can improve the code of your Lambda functions or, or the containers, or maybe you look at how to improve the search. What Cinch did in this instance is they took a completely different approach. They rebuilt the entire implementation of this part of their system from the ground up. Serverless and event-driven architectures enable you to do that because you can iterate and move so quickly. You can develop and get MVPs out there really quickly. And it gives you this possibility to not need to refactor your existing code, not need to touch your existing code. Take the lessons that you've learned from the code you've built and build something new and better without all of that legacy, um, legacy cruft hanging around. So this is what they move to. They introduced EventBridge to decouple this search component from the other components. 
And the, the search team then had their own um, implementation that they could do. They, in this case, they built it on top of open search. So instead of loading things from DynamoDB, they introduced open search or it's uh, elastic search and they built their search on top of that. And then it became much more scalable. Serverless enables you to move fast and iterate quickly. And it opens up this possibility to be able to just build a new proof of concept really quickly. For any of you who've started to work with Lambda and work with serverless architectures, it's incredible how quickly you can just get something running in production, get an MVP running, and not need to worry about spinning up infrastructure or clusters or ECS instances or anything like that. So let's consider this on our architecture now. Let's say that the Lambda function that we built was that was processing from SQS. Um, let's say that Lambda function started to have too much, too, too much logic. It was doing too many things. It had an entire business workflow coded within that single Lambda function. It started to become a little bit of a monolith. Now, again, if we were doing this in a traditional way, we might start to look at that code and try to optimize that code and refactor that code. What we can actually do now, because we've got this event driven serverless architecture, where it's really quick to get started, we can just actually hook into that same event stream. So the same production event screen that's sending data to SQS, we could also route them same events to another SQS queue. And then maybe we start to build a completely new workflow from the ground up using a service like step functions, because we've realized that this Lambda function is in essence a workflow now in itself. So we want to just replace it. We don't want to try and refactor it. We don't want to try and change any existing code and break any existing functionality. What we do instead is just build something new for the ground up. We build version two of this Lambda function and we do that in step functions. And then we've tested this, we've started to work with this, and we eventually realized that our step functions work. And then we just did you know, retire, we, we, you know, going back to the seven hours from Ashish's part of this presentation, we just retire that existing SQS function and Lambda function. And now we've got our system built on SQS and step functions. And this can apply in so many places in your application, again, because it is so quickly just to get up and get started with serverless, you can start to do these proof of concepts and try new things and build new things and see how they work. Okay, so that's all I had um, in terms of migrations content. I did say at the start and I did pop on LinkedIn, if anyone has any specific serverless questions, anything that they've thought of previously, anything that I've talked about before that they want me to dive deeper on, pop that in the chat now. Um, I do have one question that I will go through in just a second. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. So yeah, API gateways and application load balancers can coexist and that is a common pattern. So if you maybe have some legacy infrastructure that was running on with an ALB in front of it and you had some new modern, maybe serverless things, you could put an API gateway in front of all of that so that that's the single point of entry into your system. And some of the requests will root off to your old architecture and some of the requests can then root off to your more modern Lambda architecture. That's the power of these API gateways or application load balancers is that it enables you to route to multiple places at once. And I'm glad we actually mentioned API gateway because that is the question that was posed on LinkedIn talking about API gateway. So thanks, Nividita, for the question. Um, I have paraphrased your question a little bit here um, just to make it fit on the screen. But the question was that if you have a prod and a non-prod, application in the same AWS account, an API gateway is getting throttled because you do have limits on API gateway in your account. What is an ideal approach to, a, to, to getting around this throttling without introducing some kind of more multi-account setup? Now I will start and say that typically a multi-account setup is generally considered a best practice in AWS to split your production away from your non-production. But of course, that isn't always the case. So with API Gateway and throttling, there's four different ways in which API Gateway gets throttled. So there's throttling limits imposed by AWS across the whole of API Gateway. That's not something that you can control as um, a customer. That's throttling across all accounts and all clients in a given region. 
So AWS can throttle at that level. Then you have throttling in your individual account. So API Gateway, like most AWS services, has some element of service limits or service quotas. And that is um, that is where Nivedita is likely seeing the throttling here because there's multiple API gateways running in the same account. The throttling will be because they're hitting the limits of that account. So then there's also two other ways you can do throttling on API Gateway. Um, and to demonstrate that, I'm actually going to jump into the console just quickly. Um, let's hide that again and go off to the console. Um, so if I go off to API Gateway in the AWS console, you can actually provide throttling in the actual, uh, in actually in API Gateway itself. So if I come into API Gateway here, I can actually provide throttling, add throttling to an individual API and the individual stage of an API. So I could say for this production API, I actually want to limit this to 100 requests per second. And, uh, you know, in a burst, I might let people have 200 requests per second, for example. So then you can start to throttle for an individual stage of your API. And you can even go a level deeper than that. So you can even, if I look at this individual single route on my API, I can even add throttling to that individual route. So I can say that route, I actually only want to allow 10 requests per second, maybe a burst of 20 requests per second. So I can get a level deeper with the throttling that I can then control as the owner of this API. And then the final place you can add throttling, with, with it, and that's in what's called usage plans in API Gateway. And usage plans in API Gateway is where you, let's say you're building some kind of tenancy or SaaS-based solution on AWS that has the concept of API keys. You can say this API key is only allowed to make so many requests per second. So I can actually create a usage plan. Um, and this usage plan is saying you're only allowed five requests per second. And then I can assign API keys to this usage plan. So if I try and make a request to this API using that API key, that will then be throttled based on the usage plan that I applied. So there are the different places you can apply throttling. So to go back to Nivedita's question then, um, if you're running multiple API gateways in the same account, one of which is prod and one of which is non-prod, you probably want to apply throttling on probably your dev API, because you don't want your dev API gateway to be using up the limits on your entire account. So then your prod API gateway starts getting throttled. So you probably want to apply quite tight and uh, quite limited throttling to your dev API so that when people are developing, you know, if a developer who's developing a new feature starts to get throttled, that's not maybe that bad, but the production traffic, you want that to be running with as much um, bandwidth as possible. So to answer your question, Nivedi, so that is probably the best thing to look at is to add throttling to an individual, you know, your dev APIs. If you add throttling there, then you can um, leave as much of your service limits available for API Gateway in production as possible. I hope that has answered your question. And I don't think I've seen any other questions come into the chat. So if, as always, if there are any questions that come to mind, please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or on Twitter or however you want to get in touch with me. Um, my inbox is always open. Let's just stop the screen share. Thank you, James. It was interesting to understand the basic concepts. Yeah, so yeah, hopefully people have a better understanding on how uh, API gateway works and what are the throttling options available now uh, for the behavioral track today we wanted to discuss from James that hey how your journey have been so far into AWS so James if you could help us a little bit on how your journey has been what you have done so far and how you ended up into AWS so we are all here to hear from the very basics. So don't hide things if it is not very personal. So so let us know how you started in IT and yeah. how you progressed towards what you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess it's probably better to go like all the way back. Um, so when I was in like school, you know, back in school, back in 
college. So college in the UK is what we do from 16 to 18. Um, exactly. So right back at that point, um, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Like I like computers. That was kind of cool. Um, at one point, I nearly joined the RAF, the Royal Air Force in the UK. Wow. <laughs> so I got a scholarship in college to be in the RAF. Um, that never happened. So I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. I nearly went and did aeronautical engineering um, at university. And I was like, no, I don't want to be an engineer. Um, so I, I literally at 18, I finished college, didn't go to university. And I was like, what, what do I do? I've got absolutely no idea what I want to do. Um, and it just so happened that my dad was doing a, a, a bike ride in the UK. And he was on this bike ride and there was a, a CTO of a tech company nearby. Um, and they were looking for a frontline support person, just like on the phones, handling support tickets. And I had no job. And I was done with education. So... I took this job as a as a frontline support person um and the software that the company built was like back-end software for e-commerce websites um and i very quickly learned once i started there that the best way to support customers was to actually query the database myself um, and this all ran on top of microsoft sql server and um, so at that point i started to teach myself sql server um so like, oh, this is kind of cool this whole it's not really programming, but like database development <laughs> type stuff. This is kind of fun. Um, so from there, I ended up going into like business intelligence development, like ETL, mm -hmm. data processing. And then I started doing that. And I was like, you can do really cool things in data processing if you know a programming language. And this was all like Microsoft stack. So I was like, oh, I should probably teach myself .NET. <laughs> so <laughs> then I was like, okay, I can do this. So then I started to learn C Sharp and .NET. Um, and then it just kind of spiraled from there. So from there, I started working a consultancy company uh, building like integrations more like scripting than programming i guess mm -hmm. uh, and then i discovered the cloud i went to azure first actually funnily enough as most .NET developers do um, i'm not sure i'm allowed to say that on this on this stream <laughs> um so yeah i went to azure first um just because that's the natural place for .NET developers did quite a bit of stuff with azure and then started to use aws um discovered serverless and then the rest was kind of history from there <laughs> I picked That's up nice. serverless um and then yeah been at AWS now for for just about a year just over a year I guess um so yeah it was all just completely like there was never really like an intention to go and like go and I'm going to get this job like I'm going to go and do this or do that um it was more just like a you know, I think it's something I get from my mum and dad actually so my dad's always been like up really early really hard worker like just just, just got really good work i think um so i've learned a lot from him and then my mum has like changed careers completely like six times now she like sold cars then she was a milk woman and then she owned the beauty salon and then she did something else so i think that attitude of like just there's if you, if you put your mind to something and you work hard and you've got the work ethic you can exactly. start to achieve things but yeah there was never a point in my career where i've been like i am going to go and do that apart from aws i got to a point and i was like yeah i want to go and work there so then i went and i started the process at aws good now i know you did some serverless thing as a freelancer give us some detail on that what was that stint <laughs> so i did that for about um so i actually started off uh, initially i started off a, a company with my brother so my brother works in like user graphic design user experience design so he used to design websites and i used to build websites um so we ended up working with a company who just wanted a website initially and then they wanted to launch a cyber security training platform um mm -hmm. so i already had a relationship with like the ceo and the cto and they knew i was you know, a bit techy so they're like do you want to build it for us i was like yeah of course i do <laughs> so um that this was a yeah, like a, a training, so for the, like business to business, um, so a company can go to them and they can buy like training programs and training courses for cybersecurity for, for their staff. Um, so that was actually, funny we've been talking about migrations today, so that was actually initially built on EC2, a single EC2 instance, a .NET app on a single EC2 instance. And then I migrated that to the cloud on containers. And then I was like, ah, actually, no, these container things are too complicated. Let's do these Lambda thing. Um, and then move that to serverless. So once we moved to serverless, they, they, they scaled up from, I think when I when I stopped working with them, they were at about 400, no, 100,000, 200,000 users. Um, mm -hmm. from nothing when I started, that was over like three or four years, they scaled up. And of course, because we moved to serverless as they grew, 
Um, yeah. It just, and then I've done a few other things. I've did some work um, for a startup who was selling some software to the NHS. Um, I did some work for a couple of other smaller startup type businesses. Um, but yeah, it was fun. It was fun to do some, you know, um, to to be everything from like gathering requirements, um, almost like a salesperson in some respects to then like architecting to actually developing and then actually supporting because I was the only person I was the freelancer. So, um, that was kind of interesting. Nice. And if, if I, if I ask you a question, like what was the turning point for your career? What do you think and how it happened? The turning point for my career, I think. So when I first, the consultancy company that I first worked for, that was, more like like i said like scripting as opposed to like development like software engineering um and as well as the consultancy part of the business they were actually building like a SaaS product so there was like a purchase order management system and they were running that in a, a, literally a server in the office where we were like this whole thing ran from a single server and it was all .NET, and i was like ah as a, as a as a fun project it'd be fun to try and get this code base running in azure um so i took this .NET application that was built to run on-premise and kind of tweaked it and, and manipulated it, refactored it a little bit, and then ran it, published it onto Azure, and then went back to the CTO of the company and was like, look what I did. It's running in the cloud now. And then nice. they took that forward and ran with it in the cloud. So I think that is probably where I first kind of, because up until that point, all the work I've been doing was like typical on-prem, like .NET development on an actual Windows server. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point where it was like, wait, if I run this in the cloud, I can just turn it off and turn it on again, scale it up, scale it down, scale it out. Do, do all this crazy stuff. Um, so I think that, that just opens your eyes to like, wow, this is this is what this cloud thing is all about. <laughs> I think that's the point where I, where I first exactly. kind of thought I want to do development as a career as opposed to just like doing whatever job was in front of me. So, um, yeah, I'd say that. Nice, good. And people are interested to hear about your interview process. Mm-hmm. How, how was your interview at AWS? How have you prepared for it? Yeah. So yeah, I had a very it is interesting. Yeah, so I had a very <laughs> specific way of preparing for the interview. So as as we all know, the interview process at AWS is around the leadership principles. Um and so there is the technical portion to it, but uh, you know, the leadership principles are the bulk of it. So what I actually did was I got I got a Word document on my laptop and I wrote down all 14, 16 leadership principles. And then for each leadership principles principle. I thought of like two or three examples for each leadership principle. And there might've been some duplication in there, but I just went through and just like brain dumped like every example I could think of for each of the leadership principles. And then I went back through it again <laughs> and made all them leadership principles, all the examples into like actual star format. So the first pass was just like brain dump, get everything out of my head. Have, yeah. And then I went back and was like, right, how can I make this star? How, what was the situation here? What was the result? What did I actually do myself? And then I went through each example and got each example in the star format. So then I had this kind of, so I wasn't in the interview. I wasn't like reading from a Word document, but I had that idea in my head of like, here are the things that I can talk about. So I was quite structured about it. And from speaking to people internally, that seems to be quite a common approach to Mm -hmm. preparing for the AWS interviews, like just, just, literally write down the leadership principles right exactly. literally write down s t a r and then next to it write down the example yeah. for each yeah, the preparation is very important now mm-hmm. if i take a step back from interview how you got sorted for a call like how, did the interviewer approached you the recruiter approached you or were you referred or you applied how that thing happened I, I just applied out of the blue. I was like, I fancy giving this AWS thing a go. Like, I, I honestly didn't think like, so the, all the companies I've worked for before that were like tiny little startups, small companies. So I just thought like, it was quite literally just like a shot in the dark. Like, yeah, let's just, let's just see what happens. The worst thing that could happen is they say no. And then I keep doing what I'm doing. Like, so it was never like, um, yeah, there was no referral. I didn't know anybody at AWS. I just mm-hmm. applied out of the blue. I think I applied for like nine different jobs, I think. <laughs> oh, good. And how, how many rounds happened for you? Like how the first was technical, I guess. Mm-hmm. Then what was the next thing? Uh, the loop. So I had one form screen, which was mostly technical. Um, mm-hmm. 
and the technical component of it was quite broad. So it wasn't AWS specific. It was exactly. quite general AWS. And that's actually a really important point for like anyone watching or listening, like preparing for the technical part of any AWS interview is that it doesn't need to be AWS. It doesn't you're not asked AWS, you're not asked like what's an EC2 instance. Like that that's not a requirement. Um and then it was the loop, then it was the sort of five interviews back to back, um, where we got into the behavioral leadership principle type questions. Um, but yeah, just the two stages. Good. Now there are some questions like how long did it take for you to prepare for the interviews? Again, the same line, like you mentioned that. And then uh, my, my question is like, I get this question also on LinkedIn a lot of time, James, and I want you to answer that so that everyone knows, like, do we need to have separate stories for every leadership principle? And do we need to have two or three of them for every, every principle? Um, so I, you can use the same example multiple times, because of course the same example could demonstrate exactly. multiple leadership principles. So it is, it is. Possible. And like I said, when I went through the process that I went to, the same example was there in multiple leadership principles. Um, so I think it is it's definitely something you can do. That like you don't have to think of, you know, 16, 32 separate examples of exactly of every leadership principle, but it is good to have some variety, of course. Like you can't just talking about the same example would then make it seem like you've only done one thing. So it's good to have a few examples, but like for me, if I was interviewing, then that would be fine for me because it's you know different things come from different different leadership principles in the same example oh, I, I have another question on the same line mm -hmm. do all these story have to be a technical story or it could be a real life right yeah absolutely um i was actually talking about um running in one of my <laughs> so my interview we were talking <laughs> about um the question was around um i can't remember what the question was around it was something around like um how do you make sure that you get the right result for a customer or something like that? Um, mm -hmm. And I was using, in, in typical Ashish style, I was using an analogy. And like <laughs> if, you're doing, if you're like navigating, if you're out in the mountains or fell running, like if you've got a map and you're looking how to get from A to B, you always start from the end point and then plan your route back. And then exactly. you always plan a second route. You always, no matter how crazy it seems, you always consider a second option. And that's obviously quite apt for tech. Like if you're trying to design a system, it's always really valuable to say, right, I've designed it in serverless. Okay, now if I was to use containers, what would that look like? Would that be better? Would that be worse? If I was to use Kubernetes or something, whatever. Um, so yeah, you can use real world examples for sure. Um, yeah. Good, thank you. And probably you answer the question, Akash had that, that also their story should be on revolving around technology. Answer is no, it could be anything which is highlighting that leadership principle. It could be real life, it could be something you didn't personally, it could be anything. We just want to see the highlighted things, not like it has to be technological driven. Yeah, right. absolutely. Nice. Uh, I have one more question related to your promotion, James. Like you got promoted in a year, so congratulations on that. And it's really hard, means I've been into four years into this and I've seen people struggling with promotions. How, how you how you work toward getting promoted? Because it may not apply to everyone right now, but probably once you are in a job, then you may have to think about the ways to get promoted. So what was the approach you followed for that? Um, so I was quite, um intentional about it so from the minute i started at aws and i've started doing it now for the next level but i got um an understanding of what the requirement was because the different it's different at every company right how you get promoted there'll be different requirements there'll be different things you need to do so i had a look at what the uh, process was for getting promoted and then i started just collecting data points so everything i did of no every every public speaking engagement I did, every customer meeting, every customer workshop, everything like Visa, I just made a note of it. So I had a big, massive document with just bullet points in it. I'm like, oh, this week I did a public speaking engagement to 120 people and this they said this. So I just had this massive page of all the things I've done because, you know, if you if, if you go into a job and then you're up for promotion two years later to try and remember something you did two years ago, exactly. you just, you'll just never be able to remember it. So it's just a really good, practice to get into is just to record everything you do of note like you know every good thing you do every valuable thing you do write it down the other benefit this has 
is that when you're having them weeks that we all have where you're like, I'm so stupid, I'm terrible at my job, you can look back at this list of notes and be like, oh, actually, yeah, this is just one of them weeks where things aren't going so well. So it's actually quite a motivating thing to look back on as well. But yeah, that was the kind of process I took was just to write down as much as possible and have it written down so that I can refer yeah. back to it when it comes to actually doing my exactly. promo. I call that document the brag document. I am bragging about myself, yeah, but yeah. why not? Yeah, if you are like doing that. something great, if you feel this is helping people, uh, yeah, data matters exactly. That's you said that yes, exactly. Keeping record always matter, and it keeps you also on track. It's like a navigation point. If I do not see that what I have learned in last week, then I have to keep myself pushing that. Hey, I haven't learned something or I haven't explored something new, so that yeah. keeps me motivated too. That's good yeah, thing. Man. Now, uh, one more question I have, like, what would be your advice for people who are trying to get into a cloud role? Because a lot of people come from non-tech background, they're trying to learn cloud, or they may be having a background, but let's say in SAP or maybe mainframe, and they are trying mm -hmm. to migrate to cloud. So what would be the approach they should follow? What would be you doing if you were in their shoes? So I think... Um, so and this is very much my opinion, <laughs> but I think proof, uh, not proof, um, examples of things that you've built or things that you've done, in my opinion, is more valuable than AWS certification. So when I joined AWS, I only had the cloud practitioner cert. I didn't have any other certs. I've got more now, but <laughs> I didn't have any other certs. Um, but I had examples of things that I'd built. I had like an active GitHub page. I had I've not really started doing the YouTube stuff then, but I think being able to talk about actual things that you've done and things that you've actually built, actually been hands-on with, is can be more important than actually certs. Now, certs are important in their own way to get like a foot in the door. Some places will require a cert, but if a job, if a, you know, if a job description says you need to have the associate SA cert for AWS, that's no reason not to apply for that job, right? You know, because that might just be a soft requirement. You don't know that. So in my opinion, I think having hands-on experience, having built something, having designed something, having to be able to talk about things you've actually done is, in my opinion, at least in tech, the the best the first step to take or the best, best way to move forward, as opposed to focusing solely on getting certifications. Again, that's just my opinion. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, really I agree on I second that. Have. Um, the open opportunities and things like that, but um, yeah, actually building things is 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 great. Makes sense. Good. And any final advice to people? Any final advice? People have mentioned that a participant has mentioned about your love for books. So maybe <laughs> yeah. how yeah. how how books shaped you means obviously you could see a lot of books behind, and you obviously mention a lot of book every session. So. So let me know what, what you think about books and what kind of books you prefer to read. Um, so I almost, like, I'm, I'm, I'm a proper nerd. I almost completely <laughs> tech books or, um, yeah, nerdy books. Um, the kind of books I read, though, like there's not a lot of books behind me there that are like, um, like AWS specific books or like .NET specific books. They're all books about like software architecture, software design, because... I guess with something like you know the, becoming a solutions architect and being a solutions architect, the um, the principles behind things are more important than the technologies themselves. So like exactly. eventually Lambda, like eventually Lambda won't exist anymore. Eventually uh, Kubernetes won't exist anymore. But the the fundamental ways of building good software, things like domain driven design and 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 the fundamentals of software architecture and testing and continuous deployment they will live they will be persist forever they'll be gone forever like eric evans wrote domain driven design in 2004 and it's still fundamental now like how were people building software in 2004 i don't even know so oh. <laughs> um yeah so i tend to focus on books that are more general because like i said technology changes and, and you can you know you can teach yourself a new programming language or an AWS service but the fundamentals are, are much more important that saying i've just started reading the kubernetes bible so this could be interesting. <laughs> I thought I'm, I'm doing this serverless thing too much. I need to learn why. I need to learn what this fuss is about with this Kubernetes thing. Because I think that's another important thing, actually, that I will just say about reading is to read books that challenge your view of how you look at. Yeah. I think serverless is the only way to build applications, but 
I think it's important to understand Kubernetes enough to know why. Why not use Kubernetes? Or why to mm-hmm. use Kubernetes? I don't know. So that's something else to try and do is look at, like, try and oppose your own viewpoint, if you will. And that, I guess, that's bigger than tech. That applies anywhere. But... Nice. That's an interesting point. Exactly. Yeah, for me, my books love is like I take some heavy books to my sleep. So when I'm not getting asleep, I will pick up a very complicated nerdy book and yeah, maybe yeah. in 10 minutes I am out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, books are a very important thing. And there's actually really good science behind that as well, actually. Like the things <laughs> you read right before bed tend to persist better in your memory. So there is, exactly. actually, there is actually science behind that being the best time to read books. If you fall asleep after 10 minutes, maybe... I don't know how long it takes you to finish your book. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Thank you. Any last minute question, anyone from the audience, anyone, James is here, pick his brains. If you have any question, any doubts, any confusion, and obviously it's not the only option. You could obviously reach out to us on LinkedIn. We are happy to help. So feel free to reach out. We want to help as many as we can. So just leverage us. I'm just looking back through the notes. The, the, the questions in the chat. Uh, so someone did ask, what courses did I take in the beginning to learn? Yeah. Um, so I've never actually taken a formal course, course, like an actual official course. It's just been like, like, what do I need to do right now as part of my job? And then just get really good at that thing I need to do right now. So there was a point when I needed SQL. So I just thought, right, I'll just deep dive on SQL. Mm-hmm. And after that, it was like .NET. So I'll just deep dive on .NET. But I've never done a formal training Three. course. Or okay. training thing. Um, how much experience before AWS? So I've, I've been working in tech for probably 10 years, I guess. AWS, I've been working with AWS for probably four before that. Um, so I think they're the ones I'd missed. Um, someone's saying they should use your summary book as a pillow, Ashish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. There's one more question. Like, any books you recommend for someone new? Oh, for someone new. Is that is that new to tech completely? If you just put a yes or no, like new to tech or new to AWS? Yeah, that's a two different thing. Akash question was that. So Akash, if you could say, is it tech book or non-tech? Yes, completely tech. new to tech. Whoa. <laughs> Where to start? Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's actually a really good book. I mean, it depends what your interest is. So there's a really good book by a guy called David Farley um, called Modern Software Engineering. And this is like the, the principles of how to do software engineering, like outside of the cloud and outside of AWS. This is just like the principles of what makes good software engineering. Um, this is a bit a bit chunky, but this is by far my favorite tech book ever, like Domain Driven Design. Um, that's about like software design and how to design software. Um, that's really interesting. Look at me going to my bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like I said, I, I look for things that like start with the with the with the fundamental. I'm gonna have a think about this question. If, if you've got me on LinkedIn, then just ping me on LinkedIn. Yeah. And I'll follow up on that. I'll have a look. I'll do it. I'll do a deep dive into it. So uh, actually, if you if you message me on LinkedIn, just so I know who you are on LinkedIn, <laughs> and then I'll I'll get back to you on that. Makes sense. Makes sense. So there is a comment from Purna, like we should rob your bookshelf. So stand guard to it, James. <laughs> oh. uh, the main uh, design is Eric Evans, a, a guy called Eric Evans. Um, yeah, uh, I can put good. the in the chat. Uh, All right. So in the interest of time, uh, one more minute if we have any questions, otherwise we'll wrap it up and we'll let you enjoy your day and we will meet next week. Uh, so we we end technical track with the eight week sessions. We completed the technical track, and then from the next week onward, we would be focusing more on the behavioral. So what we were doing so far, technical was like the majority, and then small section on behavioral. But then from the next week onward, for the next four weeks, we would focus more on the behavioral track. And then uh, the reinvent is coming. So I'm not sure that how many of us would be available. Like uh, James is going, I know Prasad is going, I'm sure. I got my last minute ticket to reinvent also. So I'm also coming. Nice. So nice. so so things are like little uh, not sure. But yeah, there are other volunteers who are helping us. So stay tuned. 
let us know what you want to learn more about any any suggestions any feedback and we would try to accommodate that if we know about these things and keep your support up this keeps us motivated to wake up early morning prepare good content share the content so keep us motivated thank you so much for attending and i hope to see you next week thank you james see you next week everyone take care thanks everyone thanks bye